Uh, I'm liking the swirly chair that you got, though. One of your biggest complaints was the fact that um, uh, we were, were standing? standing, right? Yeah. I love standing. I have really? a lot of energy standing. I have right? a lot of energy sitting, as you okay. can see. <laughs> I'm assuming everybody's still understanding what you're saying. This is fantastic. Um, Bro, I'm like, I've been giving khutbahs like this for the past two months, leading salah like this. Where are like, they, where are they no, doing khutbahs? No complaints. What do you mean? Every masjid is giving Juma. <laughs> I'm serious, man. <laughs> like ISG just recently. Uh... No, man. Juma has been going on for at least two months. At no. least, yes. Maybe the maybe like the daily salah they recently just started announcing like daily salahs. But okay, Juma has been back, baby. Juma All right, back. So I should start playing Juma again. Yeah. <laughs> See, here we go. This should, this should be like a, a clip by itself. Bilal <laughs> discovers that Juma is still being prayed. Oh man, or has bro? Been like I miss Juma, man. I'm telling you, man. I miss Juma, like. You know, we were so ungrateful. Like, all this stuff just got taken away from us. We were complaining about Juma. And complaining I never about complained about Juma, bro. I look forward to Juma. Really? Always. Really? Always. Juma was like an anchor in my week, man. You know what's insane? How without Juma, I would lose track of what day of the week it was. Absolutely, bro. No idea. Because, like, especially with our line of work. Right, where we don't have weekends in the traditional sense. We don't sense. have weekends in the traditional sense. I don't know what three-day holidays are. Like, I, I have <laughs> no idea about any of these things. I just have, I'm traveling or I'm not traveling. But that really made me understand, like, when they when Uthman Mi'affan, when he initiated an additional adhan for yeah. Jum'ah, and he, he was the, basically the one who initiated the adhan before the the khutbah okay and this his, is to call the people that are in the marketplaces and things like that right yeah and so yeah. his his thing was like you need to give them a heads up the city is bigger now and i i remember thinking to myself like why would i need a heads up like people know it's friday yeah but if you're talking about the ancient world like they didn't have 40 day weeks 40 hour weeks they didn't have this notion cemented of Friday off or Saturday off or something yeah. like that. The days... They didn't have weekends. It was yeah, just like every no day was a day. Weekends. Every day is a day. They just bleed yeah. into one another. I mean, another. keep in mind, like this whole five-day work week, three uh, two-day um, weekend work structure is a product of the industrialization. Absolutely. Right? So, Absolutely. But like... And, and labor laws and all sorts oh, yeah, of things, right? All of that. Uh, unions and what have you. And so this... Um, this notion of like, yeah, people need a heads up to kind of realize and be reminded that it's Juma. I'm like, you know, <laughs> that makes incredible sense. Even though you understood it, like you don't understand it until you see it and you experience it. And there have been lots of days where I'm like, oh, today's today's Friday. It's I like, had it's, no idea. It's like I, I look forward because especially with our line of work, especially with a lot of the work that I do, it's like I'm in front of a computer, man. Right? Like, Juma is a relief. Right? I get to see people. I get to hang out. I spend, like... Like, Juma is, like, my day off kind of thing. Yep. And, like, that that, that went away. You mostly pray Juma at this time in Spanish, right? Yeah. Do they do after Juma lunch? Do you not, normally go have lunch with people afterwards? Not, like, in a formal way. What Like, one of the things that's common is, like, somebody from the community might, like, uh, bake some stuff and then they'll sell it there. Right, like they'll do like the halal tamales and things like that. Okay. Um, uh, and occasionally, like somebody wants to go out. Like what I end up doing is I just end up hanging back because of their studio setup, right, with Alex and Mujahid, and um, and you know just uh, maybe helping Hang with hanging out or maybe helping just chatting whatever, right? And I love those guys, man. Alex Alhamdulillah, Mujahid, man. This is people, like, man. it's uh, if anything, like it's it's one of those things where it's just like when you're there, you feel like you're at home. Mm. You know, even even in the current, because they, you know, for anybody who's unaware, Islam in Spanish is the first Latino-led Islamic community in the uh, Western world, right? And I don't know about the Western world, but you can say the United States for sure. Well, I where mean, else? Where else? In Latin America, there, there's not there's not a single Muslim in Latin America. Not in that. Uh, in North on, America. Bro. In North America. Okay. Okay. Yeah, North America. Okay. U.S. You, Canada. You kind of made it big. You're like the whole world. Yeah, but you're right. Right, at least in the uh, at least in the North America is, is here's the common thing in in, in even in Colombia, for example, right? Uh, one of the things that I keep hearing is that 
the same kind of situation of Islam and Muslims in, um, that is here in the U.S., where it's mostly immigrant-led, with maybe a third of the community being led by African Americans because of the Malcolm X and Wardin Muhammad community. In the United States, you mean? In the U.S., right? Yeah. They're, they're like the one-third exception. It's the same scenario in Latin America, except they didn't have, like, how many convert messages do you see in the U.S.? Like, convert-built-led communities. I'm not, I'm like, is there even one? Like, if there is, like... Well, well if you're talking about the African-American community... Not, not African-American specifically, but, like, non-African-American... Uh, well, if there is African-American, that's fine, but... Well, wanna... Masjid Yassin here in Houston was built on that idea. Okay. Just recently, Masjid Yassin was built as a... As... But they're not affiliated with, like, the Warsteen no. community or anything no, like no, that? No, no, nobody. Okay. It's okay. Just... But, they're, so, but they're relatively recent. Yeah, like right? two years old. And and one of the things that, uh, 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 you know, Irtiza, right? Because he lived and worked in Colombia for a little while. And one of the things that he was communicating was that the status of Islam and Muslims and the da'wah there is very similar to what it was in the U.S. back in the 80s. Right? Uh, in the sense that their organizational development, their people development, and who's leading the communities is all immigrants. Yeah. Right? They have, like, their Arabs and Desis in South America they're heading up the communities in terms of are there uh, and it, I, I would be pressed to say and correct me if I'm wrong are the, I don't believe there are any in uh, locally indigenously led Latino masjids in South America I could be wrong like correct me if I'm wrong if there are I'd, I'd love to uh, just check it out like y'all got any YouTube channels or Facebook pages or websites like hook it up mm. I want to see um but uh, but from what I understand, it's a similar context there. And, and the disconnect is also similar, where um, the like the Spanish speaking Latino community is not. You know, Arthur, Arthur Richards, Arthur Richards. Yeah. Uh, when we did a I did a podcast interview with him for Faith While Black. Yeah. And he's from uh, Wade County in, in, in Miami. Yeah. Uh, but he's he's Jamaican. Yep. And so he went to Jamaica to go uh, spend some time over there and give da'wah there. And of course, he's been studying in Egypt for a few years now. And so when he went there, he said, I think he said the imam was Egyptian. Okay. The imam in the masjid there. Imam in the masjid in Jamaica. Yeah, in Jamaica okay. is Egyptian. And so he, uh, you know, he... Uh, you know, he, he approved Arthur teaching at the masjid and what have you. Okay. And when Arthur... Just as like a guest. Um, yeah. I okay. mean, he just, you know, yeah. where did you study this, 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 this? Okay, right. cool. No problem. And so he... Essentially, he vetted him. Well, he has to, right? <laughs> yeah, you yeah, have yeah. to always, you have to vet who <laughs> Which who is not always the case here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you should. So he, um, uh, Arthur, he was saying that he, you know, he's... He's teaching and he's in his element. And so he's he's kind of, you know, even using Jamaican, like the D Jamaican References? dialect. No, okay. the Jamaican dialect, dialect okay. like all of that. And so he said, uh, he said one elderly Jamaican man came up to him in the message and he said, you know, in his Jamaican dialect, you can check out the actual uh, interview. But he he says, you know, uh, for, I, I can die a happy now, man now for the first time. Yeah. Uh, I see an imam. Who knows the dean who who looks like me and talks like me i don't know if he said looks like me but the idea is you know he's who's like one of us yeah right um and so which that, is kind of like the sentiment that we had growing up when we met like first time i met imam saraj i was in high school yeah and i'm like yo this guy don't got an accent and he's black yeah right like literally that was my first um actually correction before him it was hamza yusuf yeah. Right. First time I heard this guy, I'm like, yo, this guy, this is not an uncle. Yeah. And I'm guessing that was this gentleman's experience. Yeah, I guess he found somebody who connected with him. I mean, it's it is definitely someone powerful. Like I remember the first time I heard a Sudanese sheikh. Like the first time I heard someone in Arabic, and I didn't even know. Yeah. I didn't even know it was something that I was missing. Like I heard, because I grew up listening to Egyptian shiuch and Saudi shiuch, mostly Egyptian shiuch and it's Saudi shiuch. The benefit of being an Arabic native. Yeah, but I'm hearing different dialects my whole life, okay. which is fine. Yeah. Like, I'm learning Islam perfectly fine, listening yeah. to Saudi shiuch and Egyptian shiuch, no problem. 
But then, you know, one day I hear a, a chef from Sudan, Sudan okay. and he's like speaking in my, and it was, it was like home cooking. You right, know? Right, it, it wasn't right. even something that I realized I was missing, okay. but it was just like, this is another layer of connection. Right. Right. Um, but you know what I've realized, man, as, as we've gotten older is that it was really, really easy for us to discredit the uncles. It was very easy. Like at 18 years old or 19 years old, I'm going I'm to defend them on this one because... Defend them on what grounds? Because I've, I've been kicked out of too many... <laughs> yeah, but at the same time... Like, like the, if, it, if the uncles had their way, I wouldn't be in the masjid. Yeah, but if we had our way, right, we could have built our own. That's the point. Is that they came and they were just like with nothing, and they're like, "We're gonna build these massages from scratch, and we're gonna save Look, money." You don't know no, that the whole idea. Here's the thing that and I, yeah, and they yeah. ruled them with an iron fist, and sure. they kicked us out of massages and things like that. Yeah. But you know, and it was cool to complain about the uncles when we were like 18, 19, and twenty. But then when you have a whole generation of people who are making these complaints and oh, they don't even speak English and they don't even do this and do that. I mean, that's not even the complaint now. The complaint now is like they won't let us do anything. Okay. Yeah. But at some point in your life, you have to stop saying they won't let us. But right, what's going to happen? And this is this is this is my hypothesis. In the next twenty to twenty-five years, all of the massages that the uncles have built. They're essentially going to become haunted houses and ghost towns. That's fine. Some of them have already. Have yeah, some already, of them have already hit that. Uh, but yeah. the reality is, is that our generation hasn't even shown a fraction of the commitment and. Because the, the fear isn't there yet. There's still a place to pray. Yeah, but even beyond that, yes, there's still a place to pray and yeah. things like that. But as far as moving things forward. Like they are, well, like. Look, let me ask you this: though. I, I give things you. Well, hold on. Yeah. I give. I give incredible credit to uh, Imam Khalid Latif and the ICNYU community, because sure. you know New York. Yeah. There was a huge. Uh, there's masjid on every block. Of course. There's well, I agree. every. There's, there's musallas on every. Yeah, musallas on every block. Lots of masjid. Yeah. Uh, very ghettoized. You know. Uh, very. You know. Like community. you need a place to pray. You don't have a reason to pray on the street. Yeah, very <laughs> Walk two blocks and you're there. Very ethnicity based. Yeah. Right. And this community of basically college students and very young professionals said, there is a void here. Yeah. And the void is the community vision that we have. Right. And they built a community vision. Uh, and, and they went through, they did exactly the steps that the, the previous generations yeah. took. Which is, you know what, we're going to be in the basement of a church yep. for three or four years. We're going to have an imam who's our imam, but he's not going to be on salary. Yep. He's not on salary by NYU right. uh, for the first couple of years uh, or what have you. Until NYU itself, like, they Game became the such a vibrant community that the university is like, oh, my God, you guys are an asset for us. Right. And the community around was like, you guys are an asset for us. Yeah. And they filled an incredible void. And there are very few organizations that but I, that I takes think our generation. Like big, yeah, but how many leaders do you need? You know what I'm saying? Like, how you can't have a generation, a generation of our generation. Our generation have not been raised as leaders. What do you, who, who, who do you want to raise them? You know what I mean? Like, it's like, bro, how much? What do you mean? Like. All they've done is read leadership books. What are you talking about, man? Our generation, all they've done is 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 mm. sit there and I I I I don't even think it's they need they have to be raised as leaders. I think it's just a matter of taking responsibility and Look, initiative. Here here's and a, sacrifice. Here, here, here's a story that has played out. Right? You cannot expect the characters that come after and, and this is like an anime <laughs> an anime reference right now. Uh like You'll, there, there, there's a common, any anime lovers, you know, there's a genre of anime called shonen, right? Character doesn't know his parents, doesn't know where he's going. He's got a vision, there's a need that he's got to fulfill. A lot of the uncles... He's the hero, basically. Well, he's the main character, for sure. Okay. He, he is the hero. Um, and like, and, and the common story of all of the immigrants that came here when it came to the establishment of the American immigrant American Muslim community was the fact that, yo, we don't have a place to pray. Great. Right. We're not going to come here, land here, and let our children not be Muslims. Right. Great. That, like, 
very virtuous, right? Great. They establish a place to pray. Then they're like, well, we need to own this place because we kept getting kicked out. So they buy a place. Well, we now we need to make this place look like a place to pray. Great. So they dress it up, turn it into a dome and minaret and all that stuff. Great. And then that, now, by this point, across the nation, maybe 15 years have passed until they're at that point. Right? And in 15 years, children have grown up. Maybe they've been in the message. Maybe they haven't. But... With, within those 15 years, the community has grown. It's gotten huge. So we need to expand it. Right? But then this is where the you're not living to feed yourself because you're starving. Now it's like you have abundance, and so therefore you go wasteful. Right? You, yeah, I mean, to be honest, still, you, I, I shudder every time I hear about an expansion plan. Like, it's just, I, I, I always worry right. about and, that. And, and this is, this, now, up until this point, I gave them full credit totally worthy and deserving of that credit going beyond this point they're rudderless right there is complete like we need to build a community center nobody knows what that is right yeah. everybody's has their own idea i know that's right? fine i'm with you on that but even this basic level of we need a place to pray yeah our generation hasn't even been able to pull those together because we have well, do uh, we have an uh, yes are we, I, i'm okay. about to tell you we have incredible criticisms about uh, places to pray. One of, n not the least of which is uh, women's spaces and equality of access when they come to the masjid, right? The That's, place is still there. No, 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 no. We're talking about, I'm not talking about Houston because yeah. I'm assuming they no, do I mean, a better outside job Outside of here. Houston, I'm talking but like- But even yeah. if you go back to New York, you're sure. still talking about basements. You're still talking about incredibly hideous uh prayer places for sisters right but those th those hideous prayer spaces and those basements are also reflective like you go to any uh in anybody's home right and their basements look exactly the same <laughs> the basement isn't sectioned off for the women in people's homes that's the point is that when you go to a well, masjid, when guests that come is over, the women's when section. guests come over where they yeah yeah but, but, but you get my point, right? Do you get my point well, about the? Uh, do you get my point about the masjid? The I get your point. Musalla being an afterthought. But it is an afterthought. Okay. Because the immigrant mindset is that they don't have to be there. So my point is that now a whole generation has passed. Yeah. And you have people recognizing that this is an incredibly uh, restrictive, underserved community. Sisters are just as educated uh, yeah. as guys. Uh, in many communities as affluent, more affluent, yeah. right? Than guys just as professional, more professional by and large throughout the entire country, actually. Sure. And so not just the girls, not just the women, and not just the men. Yeah. We have not been passionate, interested, committed enough. If anything, uh, they've been held back. They, 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 my they, point, Bilal, is yeah. that you're always, there's always some boogeyman who's holding us back. There's always some uh, uncle. There, we shouldn't be asking for uncles? permission from anybody. That's the point. Okay, but who, who are we asking permission for and who hasn't trained us and taught us leadership and who's holding us back? Hold, 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 check this out. When the immigrants came here, they, have, they, they answer to nobody. Who are you answering to? The immigrants. Why? What do you mean, why? What, what are you answering to? No, I'm just saying from, from, just from, a, from a rational standpoint, let's say you're a lady. Born okay. and raised here. Yeah. You've got parents. Okay. Right? And let's say that lady's like, I feel unwelcome at the masjid. Build a new one. And you're going to get all kinds of resistance and criticism and social pressures. Like, what are you trying to do all this stuff for? Go get married and have kids. I don't believe that. No, that, that I mean... I don't believe is that. It, people, is that not true? I don't believe that at no. all. No. I mean, ask, people, I'm, I'm asking people, the ladies People watching. volunteer their lives yeah. to dozens and hundreds and thousands of causes people muslims every day they dedicate their lives sure, volunteerism to, is, is is very what do you much think they're doing with masajid they're volunteering volunteering, volunteering at a masjid versus masjid. building your own i don't i don't see a, any difference between building no one's writing a check for a 1.5 million dollars but as a community yeah. as a group of like because the community doesn't buy into this as, as a, the the the, the, the same people that'll cut a thousand dollar check or ten thousand dollar check I don't for need... an expansion are not going to cut a check for a okay, wom so, woman led masjid. Okay, so that's a fair point. That is a fair point, which is an argument that some people make is that 
our generation does not have as much disposable income as they did. That is true. Okay, that's fair. But it can also be said that, again, the idea is you start small. You let people buy into your vision. You start with the storefront masjid where you're paying rent $2,000 a month, just like they did. Just like, again, I go back to the example of ICNYU, basement of a church, whatever, until people see what you're about. I'm not going to get people to buy in a million dollars worth of my, this is what I can do. Right. I have to show them leadership. I have to show them commitment. I have to show them a vision. Yeah, I but, have to show them a path and then people will but, buy it. But, but somebody who's grown up in comfort has always had access to all this stuff. They would really need to be suffering in order to go through everything that their parents went through. But we're not even talking about really suffering and going through what their parents Bro, you're go through. About, you're, I'm you're not talking about, about immigrating to a different country no, and learning no, a new no, language. No, you're talking about I'm some, talking about a, having a, a passionate, startup, man. I'm, you're you're okay. talking about creating a startup. I'm talking about that, passion that's, that's, that's your life for the next five years. Okay. So then we should just stop complaining about what the uncles do and what the uncles don't do because we don't even have the, the passion to commit five years to something. Well, be, here's the thing. Because at worst case scenario, look, pe people are more motivated by pain than they are by pleasure. Right? It, do you not agree? Oh, uh, yeah. Right? Sure. And so if one does nothing, worst case scenario, you could hop onto another measure if you really wanted to pray. And if in the case of a woman, like they, that, I'm saying the pain isn't just about prayer. That's my thing. Like whenever I'm I'm hearing conversations and the conversations that we have, mm -hmm. it's not just about prayer. It's about community. It's about being unmasked. It's about yeah. it's about. It's, I, I, it's, I have it, my own. Uh, uh, the, uh, these are criticisms the, of uh, that whole. <laughs> okay, so this is what people are talking about. They're not talking about. Oh, I need. We all understand that a person can walk into a masjid. And again, sisters might, even with regards to that, they yeah. might tell you, no, I can't just walk into a masjid, right? It's much more difficult than that. It's it's sister section being closed or they're not being a sister section I mean, in the uh, first place. A simple example, right? Uh, my sister, she walked into the masjid, she didn't have her hijab with her, right? She wanted to pray and she's like, hey, can I borrow somebody's hijab? Or is there a hijab I can borrow? And all of the responses that she got is like, why didn't you bring your own? Yeah. Right? It's just like, what? I'm here to pray. See? Right? And so, uh, like for her, it's like, all right, fine, I'm just going to pray. I mean, <laughs> and so, uh, like in terms of like worst case scenario, fine. I mean, I hate you, but I'm just going to pray. Mm. It's not like, oh, they kicked me out, right? And this whole idea of unmasked, it's like, okay, fine. You know, you got your feelings hurt. You gave a bad review and that's it. You, you're done. And now you go about your, uh, you, go, you go about your life. That's what this. That's what they're all about. At least, correct me if I'm wrong. Anyway, my 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 uh, my, my general just hesitation with regards to, and the reason why I like to give uncles a little bit of credit is Look, because I'm with you, right? They, I see they, they, that they, they, they did. They, it's it's they more did than what we we should have been able to do more, not less. They came, didn't, well, let me they didn't this, hold what? on, they didn't know language, yeah. they didn't know territory, they didn't know, uh, and they came and at least they built Masajid and they built Islamic schools. They're like, here, you want to talk about cultural relevance, build some cultural institutions. You want to talk, of, and they even built civil liberties organizations and they built relief organizations. They're like, okay, we, we knocked out these four. As yeah. far as navigating pop culture as far as you know being wordsmiths and 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 artists and all of that type of stuff yeah uh that that's that's you guys you go ahead and take care of that well even then i would argue it's not right even from the pressure i think hassan Mahaj put it really really well right in just one line he's like his parents come to the country they're like yo we need to we need to survive right and he's like in our generation we just want to live man what does that mean like we want to, we, we, we want to eat from the fruits of the trees that our parents planted. Okay. So what does that mean? What that means is we don't want to go planting new trees. Okay. As a generation, that's our mindset, right? We want to celebrate the trees that are bearing fruit. Maybe that's short-sighted, but that's the reality of the, uh, 
Uh, so is that a, is that a criticism or what is that? I'm just saying it's a reality, right? The uh, full what, credit what, to the uncles what, in the sense that when I hear yeah. when I hear people talking about the uncles and stuff like that, I really feel like just kids who are waiting on their parents' inheritance. Well, yeah, that, that look, that's what a lot of them are. <laughs> to be fair, they're waiting for them to die off, which is crude, right? Which, uh, but they're waiting for them to die off so that maybe they would inherit it, but it's not going to happen because they're not going to be invested enough to, you know, move forward with it. They're not going to be connected enough to move forward. Here's, again, I don't, th it's the issue with our generation. I think our biggest problem for the most part, is the affluence that we live with. We're comfortable. Uh. We may not individually be making as much as they did because we didn't have to work as hard, right? Or maybe we are making as much, if not more. But most people of our generation of the immigrant disposition, Arabs and Daisies, doctors and engineers, were themselves put towards doctor, uh, you know, medical and engineering and technology, have do well for the most part and you know they're comfortable and with affluence comes like yo like i got a place to play worst case scenario i know where to go for Eid and juma like i'm not dying here i'm not afraid of my kid not being muslim which in fact it might even be a greater threat for the third generation <laughs> I mean, if a person doesn't see that threat, then I don't know where they're living because that's the point is that if you have a masjid that culturally is uh, foreign and you have people who are not going. I wouldn't they, say it's they, culturally foreign. Maybe that's a New York thing, right? But a lot of the communities, masjid, that are part of of our generation it's still very country clubbish. Does that make sense? I mean, I think that just depends on... In, I, I don't think it's Masajid. I think it's entire, like, city's culture. I, I feel like that's a, like... Uh, I love Southern California. I love the people in Southern California. But they will tell you themselves, like, we're cliquish. Yeah. I just happen to to be accepted in some cliques in Southern California. Because they're part of those cliques. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, but they'll tell you, they're like, yeah, we're super cliquish. Like the people we know, the, you know what I mean? You'll go to like some and, community. And, and that's the challenge of navigating the Muslim community in the United States. It's no, like, I don't think it's the United States. Like, for example, I don't feel, Yeah. but I'm from New York, but I don't feel like New York is cliquish. I feel like anybody can come New to York's New York. New York's super ethnic though. Not only is it super ethnic, it's used to people coming in all the time. Well, it's a revolving door. There's turnover. Yes, but that, that's why I don't feel like people are cliquish because I feel like people show up all the time. You're new here. Yeah. Welcome. They get to know you. Sure. And you find a place. But like even in New York, go to Long Island. Go to Well, Long Island is different. Right. Go to uh, or go to Jersey. No, no. First of all, yeah. when I say New York, I don't mean any of those. OK. okay? When I say you're taking, York, you're strictly I mean, Island. I mean, no, I mean, New York City, the five boroughs. Like yeah, but Long people, Island or no. Queens. Right? Queens is the five boroughs, bro. Right. Queens and Brooklyn. That's like, five boroughs. Yeah, they got, they, got, they got some clickishness in there. I mean, I'm sure you'll find clickishness there, but I'm saying as a city culture, I don't feel like it's, I don't feel like it's, it's, it's like that. But like, for example, Texas, yeah. it was one of the strangest things in the world to me when I heard, you know, uh, people call people who were moving here transplants. I thought that was the strangest thing in the world. You heard that term, right? Well, yeah, but generally anybody that moves from no. within the U.S., no, it's not general. I've yeah, never no, heard it of it before. No, it's not. Within corporate IT culture, if you are, let's say you got a job at corporate Google. Corporate IT culture is not culture. It's not, what's it called? It's, it's not popular culture. Okay, corporate IT culture and uh, just corporate culture in general is the common culture for the immigrant Muslims. No. Absolutely. It, no, it isn't. It's the common culture for a a a, a sector of immigrant Muslims, which is male desi dudes between like the age of okay so whatever if if you're if you're uh, uh, a medical professional but my point but medical, my point but my point is this my point is yeah. this this term of being a transplant as if to say that you are like everybody relocates from somewhere for work like that's right, normal but they, technically they're a transplant 
Habibi, I'm not talking about technically or not. I'm saying <laughs> creating a term for this is just weird. It was just foreign to me. Okay. Again. Yeah. I mean, I've never heard of a trans. Tra I'm I'm coming from an experience where people are relocating into New York all the time. Okay. Never heard this term of. Yeah, but when you come to New York, you don't come to New York from a, typically. You don't come to New York from within the U.S. Uh, typically. No, that's not true. There are lots of people who come to New York for for work, especially people who are coming in their twenties. I mean, oh my goodness, so many people come. But the vast majority, would you agree? I it's no, it's the number one destination for sure for immigrants. Yeah. So yes, it's where America meets the world, as the slogan says. Yeah. But there are lots of people who come to New York from, and you know, there are they considered real New Yorkers? No, not really, right? <laughs> and they were criticized even during COVID for moving back home when COVID hit. <laughs> but um, yeah, just the, the notion of but that like term if you was if you're born and raised in New York, and you get a job. And you go to say Boston, DC. They'll call you a transplant. Yeah, yeah, or LA, or or or. Uh, I, I, Bay Area. I just found it weird. I never heard that term before. Okay, I'm not certain that that term actually exists. Because like when I came to DC, saying. like they called me a, a transplant from New York. Because essentially, the job required that I literally pick up everything. And what I'm saying is that that is normal. It's not something unique to you or to anybody else. People relocate all the time for opportunity and work. I mean, that's, you know what we would say? They moved here from. <laughs> that's what we would say. We wouldn't say they're a transplant. You know, I just, found, I just found it irritating. And I won't say disrespectful, but I definitely didn't like the term. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. But it's, it's there. It, it, it's, it's a non-emotional, neutral reality for most people. What's that, that they move? No, the... The, the, uh, the term? The term, No, I yeah. wouldn't use the term. I think it's a silly term. Like, if you got a job at Dell, right, or IBM, okay, doing their marketing. Okay. And they say, yo, we, you got to move to uh, San Francisco. I would move to San Francisco. Right. and therefore, you would be technically a transplant. And they would refer to you for a short time as somebody who is a transplant. If people did that, yeah, and they referred to me as a transplant, not like, I, hey, I, you're a transplant, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? But like, I just, I, I, I would assume that they don't have. I would assume maybe an IT professional could say something like that yeah. because uh, maybe they just, you know, I, I would think that that person doesn't have a strong command of language, to be honest. Medical people use it. Yes, for a. Organ transplant. <laughs> That's what they use it for, Bilal. They don't use it for a person moving to a new city. What do you guys think, right? If uh, or, or have you experienced this term, and do you guys are you on team rhyme or team reason? <laughs> yeah, like words have meanings. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I just don't. I I, I don't. I don't. But like I think that. in this case, there's there, there's a lot of subjectivity. Yeah. To uh, to the subjectivity meaning. on whether they know the language or not, or in terms of what emotions you associate with the term. That's true. Right? That's true. Because at the end of it, it goes back to the original discussion we were having regarding the idea of a community. Right? It's just like it's, it's once you've established a place to pray and you've built it out to make it look like it's a place to pray. Right? And a transplant always has the connotation of being foreign. Sure. That's the thing. Yeah. That's, that's also not a good... Uh... But like even myself, although I've been in Texas now, you know what years. you know what the Arabs say when okay. a person comes to them. They say ahlan wa sahlan. You are <laughs> you are family and you are easy. Okay. Right. Yeah. They they remove all concepts of foreignness. Yeah, but, that's but but this ain't no Arab land, bro. Yeah. Right. Um, well, there is there is an idea of southern hospitality, which uh, the culture of which did make uh, moving into Houston from DC easier. Um, but, uh, it was interesting was I found that I had to explain myself more in DC than I did in Houston. In what sense? In the sense of like, if I was from DC, I'm like, yeah, I came out from Jersey. Right. I'm in Houston. They're like, yeah, I moved out here from DC, but like, but people are like, all right, cool. You moved out here from DC. It's a common thing. Right. Uh, and even people moving out of Texas is a common thing too. Not as much as put people moving in. Yeah. But it's like people, it's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they don't look at you as a, like you come into New York or DC, you're looked at as a foreigner, even if you're not. But you come out to 
say even in Houston or Dallas, if you don't look the part of a foreigner, then they don't treat you like a foreigner. You know what I'm saying? No, I don't. In New York, everybody looks foreign. What do you mean? Well, I guess it depends on where you're working. Okay. By foreign, you mean looking like you're coming from a different country? Right. Like if you're wearing, uh, you know, dress pants with white sneakers and an olive green dress shirt that fits inappropriately. Okay. Then uh, most likely <laughs> you are a foreigner. Okay. Um, but you're saying here you could wear the same outfit and nobody would think you're foreign? Right. Now, with Texas, it's a little bit different. Living in Clear Lake, more common here for people to move into, say, Houston from a different part of the country than it is on the East Coast cities. And I was so disappointed when Click uh, when I found out that they uh, gutted that gym. The gym? Makes sense. Nobody was using it. Yeah, I thought that I, there would be... Turn, I didn't realize that's that what I thought. I mean, if that if that gym was in again, if that gym was on the East Coast, it would be packed twenty four seven. Well, I think part of part of the challenge is that nobody goes to Click outside of, uh, uh, you know, not gonna be in a shop. Um, yeah, but the, the, again, the reason is because because they're out in the boondocks and out no, in the no, service people road. People live around there. I mean, people live around there. It's just that they. Again, like the dynamics are different as far well, who's as who's gonna go. How are you gonna go to the gym? Except you have a thumbprint. I mean, that's not hard. You go into the office and you get your thumbprint done. Right, but now that's a whole nother barrier and step, and you gotta wait. Yeah, it was. I mean, I happened to get the thumbprint because I was renting the office. It's not that big of a deal. There's a person in the office. You just go and you ask for gym access. They give you gym access. It's not hard. Right, but if you want a gym access when nobody's in the office after six o'clock, then what? What I'm saying is you go there and they create the thumbprint for you. That's what they did. You got a thumbprint, didn't you? I only got the thumbprint just by the fact that, oh, you guys have a gym here. Let me get this. Everybody knows there's a gym there. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's lots of people who have thumbprint access. The thumbprint access is actually like a very convenient way of people being able to get yeah. in there. You know. Unfortunately, not people were uh, using it. Well, that's a different dynamic, right? It's the issue of, I think it's an issue of affluence. Like in the mindset is different. Like when you're in the inner city, yeah. like people are comparing $20 a month charges with $10 a month charges, trying to save $5 on a monthly charge yeah. for a gym. So if there's something that's free, oh my God, you know, people would be all on it because... I mean, it's, I mean, money, yeah. but when you're in the suburbs and people are doing People well, paying 150 a month for a lifetime. Yeah. So they're <laughs> like, why would I go to the masjid gym that's, you know, bare bones? Where and I but that was a charm, man. It had everything you needed. It had that squat rack. You could do everything, all the strength training. Again, you're coming with bumper that. Bumper plates. You're coming with that East Coast East Coast mind. Yeah. You know? So give me a barbell with some bumper plates. Oh, which speaking of which, I bought. Uh, Bro, when I was when I was in Jersey City, I remember they had a garage, and that garage was a car garage, Mr. Tawheed. Oh yeah, across the street. Across the street. Yeah. At some point in time, some kids had gotten a bench. Yeah. Did they, build, did they had, build it or did they just kind of? No, someone had brought a bench. Okay. Just a regular, and I guess someone had brought some weights, some yeah. dumbbells. Maybe it got to the level where there was a barbell yeah. and some weights. Maybe. And it was just in the corner. It was literally in the corner of the parking garage. It was yeah. a closed parking garage. And dudes were there all the time getting workouts in. All the time. Yeah. That's all they had. Just a bench press, some dumbbells, and some... Yeah. And eventually, because this was before I had actually got there. But when I got there, it was like... It was one of the main the pain points. Okay of you know some of the guys there is that it got thrown out oh, is that okay, that bench press okay, okay. got thrown out and why did it throw it out i mean i can understand if they want to use the space for something else like they no no click. the administration I, I think the the argument was that you know youth hanging out there um uh, smoking cigarettes smoking weed i don't remember if weed was it but like that was the kind of like atmosphere like or that was the, the I mean, argument against. I can understand smoking weed, but you ain't gonna be smoking cigarettes and pushing big weights. Yeah, <laughs> they just like, dude. <laughs> I think somebody made something up. It was, you know, also <laughs> something like after nine eleven, like 
Masajid were incredibly, it probably took around 10, 12 years after 9-11 for them to be comfortable with young guys hanging out at Masajid. Mm. Like there was a, a, a lot of times where if you were just young and just a bunch of you and your friends sitting in the masjid on an afternoon, like the masjid didn't want you there. Yeah, because they were afraid. Were, they, they were afraid, afraid that you were... Uh... You were too big of a liability. There were yeah. some masjid where they literally just kicked kids out, you know? I've, <laughs> yeah, I've experienced but, it, man. Yeah, but I'm sure not for like just being there. Maybe you were wrestling or maybe you were doing something. But for them, it was literally just being there. Like, no, you, you got to leave. Sorry. So, I mean, I, I for one occasion, I was, uh, uh, I took a nap in the back, right? Yeah. Another occasion, I made a passing joke about, like, they're telling us to leave uh, and they didn't want to hang, they want us hang out. I was like, what? You're afraid we're going to rob your donation boxes? Yeah. And they want to call the cops. Uh, another, another situation. But I was like, yeah, you know, you know there's something it turns where, out that... where I threatened to rob their donation boxes and they called the cops. You know, no, it's turned... so silly. I mean, but, I mean, I just the way that they're telling us to get turned out that they did get robbed. Uh, yeah, but, there you go. Um, uh, Sorry, I just rubbed my microphone just now. The uh, a, a, another situation was because uh, you know they wanted they didn't want me playing basketball there because yeah. I was apparently distracting the other kids. Mm -hmm. uh, from their uh, so you were playing basketball during the Quran Halapa. <sighs> no, I was playing basketball during Sunday school, which was a complete joke. Okay. So, 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 so your explanation actually of why you got kicked out all time <laughs> made absolute sense. I was because uh, uh, you know put on some COVID weight. I'm uh, 235 pounds. I went from being able to do 21 straight pull-ups to uh, just over five. Yeah, 235 is a lot of weight to pull up. Yeah. The Arabs uh, they call the karsh you know it's your honor so you gained a lot of honor during covid <laughs> you know it's funny because with Omar bin Khattab somebody because uh, somebody uh, he saw somebody with the gut uh -huh. and he's like what is this and he's like it's the fadl of Allah and he goes like no this is the punishment <laughs> 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 it's the punishment of Allah uh, and I was just, it's just like every time I see that I see I look myself in the mirror I'm like man I, I, I gotta and I just realized what my mistake was I gotta start going back to Jummah you got to start going back to the 